Hello and welcome to this A-Level Chemistry exam question walkthrough about the acids and bases topic. Feel free to download the question from the link in the description, have a go at it yourself, and then watch this video and see how you got on. Pure water dissociates slightly, as shown by this equilibrium. We've got water on the left, then we've got the reversible reaction symbol, and then we've got hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions on the right-hand side. We've got the enthalpy change symbol showing us it is positive, so endothermic. The Kc expression is shown here for the equilibrium constant. We've got the products on the top with square brackets, which means concentration, and then reactants on the bottom. And then the ionic product of water, Kw, is shown here as H plus concentration multiplied by OH minus concentration. In A, we are asked to explain why the water concentration is not shown in the Kw expression. So remember these concentration values are equilibrium concentrations. So if we imagine before that equilibrium was established, let's say we had a billion water molecules, such a small number of those molecules dissociate, let's say two, and then we've got at equilibrium two less than a billion water molecules, and we've got two hydrogen ions and two hydroxide ions. And so the concentration of water is effectively a constant. And certainly we can say that it's very large in comparison to the hydroxide ions and the hydrogen ions. And so as a result of that, the Kw incorporates the water concentration into it. It's kind of taken as the product of Kc multiplied by the concentration of the water. And so this equilibrium very much lies to the left-hand side of the expression, really significantly so, as you can see from the Kw values in the next question. So we only need to say one of these options that I've been putting with the forward slashes, but they all kind of add together to give the full picture, but only one of them for that one mark. And then we're shown in table one how temperature increases affect the value of Kw. And we've been asked in part B why the value of Kw increases as the temperature increases. And so the first mark for this is to say that the forward reaction in the equilibrium is endothermic, as we can see from the given value here. Sometimes you're not given this value and you're just expected to know that a dissociation requires energy, so is endothermic. And so as a result of that endothermicity, the equilibrium will shift to the right hand side when the temperature is increased, which gives us a greater concentration of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions, and so the value of Kw will be larger. In C, we're asked to give the expression for pH, then to calculate the pH of pure water at 50 degrees, and we're commanded to give the answer to two decimal places. That's standard for pH values because it's a log scale and the two decimal places are important. Then we're asked to explain why water is considered neutral at 50 degrees C. Firstly then, the expression for pH is that pH is negative log to the base 10 of the hydrogen ion concentration. And to be honest, we don't need to put the base 10 here because that's a sort of a requirement of a maths paper. In chemistry, we assume that when you write LOG log, we mean log to the base 10. And then for the calculation, because this water is pure, the hydrogen ion concentration is going to be equal to the hydroxide ion concentration. So Kw is the product of those two numbers. And so what we can do is we can substitute in H plus for the OH minus. And so we're left with Kw is H plus squared. And what that means is, is that H plus is equal to the square root of Kw. And at this temperature, 50 degrees C, the Kw value that we need to use is 5.48 times 10 to the minus 14, unlike at room temperature where the value is different. 1 times 10 to the minus 14 is what we take for standard Kw values if you've not been told anything different, but here we need to use this value for Kw. And so we need to take the square root of 5.48 times 10 to the minus 14. That gives us the H plus concentration. And then the pH is going to be the negative log of this value, which gives us 6.63 to two decimal points. And then we've been asked to explain why this is still considered neutral, because it isn't pH 7. 
and this is actually what I've already said. The hydrogen ion concentration is equal to the hydroxide ion concentration. And that makes sense if you consider the dissociation of a water molecule. For every bond that breaks between the oxygen and one of the hydrogens, what you're going to end up with is one hydrogen ion and one hydroxide ion for each dissociation that occurs. So that's why these concentrations are taken to be equivalent. A pH meter is calibrated using a calibration graph. To create this calibration, a pH meter is used to measure the pH of separate solutions each with a known accurate pH. They would probably use a range of different buffer solutions to do this. And so what you would have is you would have the true pHs, that's the pHs of the buffer solution that you've used, and then you would record the value on the y-axis that your pH meter is reporting, and then you would plot this as a graph which you would expect to be a straight line, and then what you would do is you would use the measured pH meter reading to determine what a true pH value is for something that you don't have a buffer solution for. And that's what you're being asked to do in part D. It, we've been asked to use figure one to give the true pH, that's the x-axis value, when the pH meter reading, the y-axis value, is 5.6. So we need to read up the y-axis, find 5.6, so that's just here, then we construct a line along to here, and then we read down to the x-axis, and we get 5.5. You'd typically be allowed to be half a square out. I think if you're going to be out, you're going to be slightly above 5.5, so you'd probably be allowed 5.5 or 5.6. And then in E, you've been asked to suggest why the pH probe is washed with distilled water between each of the calibration measurements. You'd probably have at least three different calibration measurements to construct this graph. And the idea here is that you don't want any residual solution or substance which could interfere with your reading. So if you've just dipped your probe into pH 4, you don't want to have some of that buffer left on the pH meter when you move on to pH 7, for instance. And so you need to communicate the idea that different solutions must not contaminate each other. The calibrated pH meter is then used to measure the pH during a titration of hydrochloric acid, strong acid, with sodium hydroxide, a strong base. And we're asked here to explain why the volume of sodium hydroxide added between each pH measurement is smaller as the end point of the titration is approached. And so the idea here is that you don't want to miss the end point. If you add it in two cm cubed portions at a time, which you probably would early on during this titration, then you're very likely to overshoot. And so what you would probably do is go up in twos early on, then maybe 0.2s closer to the end point, and probably 0.1s at the last minute. And so you don't want to miss the end point because that's where there is this large change in pH. And so that's when you want your pH to be detected. You want to notice this point. And if you were using an indicator, you'd want it to change colour during this region of the curve. And during this titration, you would collect the data and you would plot a graph. And this is the graph that we would expect. And so you can see that we're using hydrochloric acid because it's a very low starting pH, below 1 by the look of this y-axis value. And you can see that sodium hydroxide is a strong base because we're finishing with a pH of something like 13 when you've got an excess of sodium hydroxide. And the end point that I was mentioning, that point where the pH dramatically increases, that is at about 25 cm cubed from this graph. And then table two shows some data about indicators. We've got three different indicators and we're told the pH range over which they change color. And then we've got the color in low pH and the color in high pH for each of them. And the student is planning to do the titration again using an indicator to determine the end point, presumably rather than the pH probe. And we're asked to state why all three indicators are suitable for this titration. And the suitability of an indicator is determined by whether it changes colour at that rapid pH change that occurs at the end point. And the answer must be that that is what they do. They all have their colour change, which coincides with this steep or this vertical region of the titration curve. And we can prove that if we find their range on the graph. And so bromocresol green changes colour at pH 3.8, which is about here. 
up to about 5.4, which is around about here. So it's towards the bottom end of this vertical region, but it is still acceptable. It would be yellow at first down here and then turn to blue thereafter. And then phenol red could similarly be used. This was very obvious that this one can be used because 6.8 to 8.4 is this region here, almost in the middle of the vertical region. And then thymolthaline, which is like phenolthaline, but not quite the same chemical structure, that is at the very top end of acceptability because it starts to change colour at 9.3 and finishes at 10.5, which is just before this vertical region starts to level out. So if you were asked to select an indicator, the safe bet is phenol red in the middle. But since they've told us that all three are suitable, then we know that it's all about the fact that they change colour in this vertical region. And then finally for this question, we are asked to do another calculation. We're told that we've got a certain volume and concentration of sodium hydroxide solution added to 25 cm cubed of a certain concentration of hydrochloric acid. And we're asked to calculate the pH of the final solution at 25 degrees C. And we're told the Kw value at 25 degrees C as well. And when you're told a Kw value, when you've been commanded to calculate a pH, that's really a bit of a clue that the final pH is going to be a basic pH above 7, because if it wasn't, then you wouldn't need the Kw at all. But I could imagine that they might try and trip you up, but that would be very, very rare. And so what you have to do here is you have to work out the amount in moles of each of these two reagents first. And so the sodium hydroxide is 36.25 multiplied by 0.2 divided by 1,000, because we need our volumes to be in decimeters cubed. And that gives us 7.25 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. And then the concentration of hydroxide ions would be the same since there is one hydroxide for every sodium hydroxide. And then similarly for the hydrochloric acid, the amount in moles would be 25 divided by 1000 multiplied by 0.15. So that's 3.75 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of that which again will be the same as the moles of hydrogen because this is a monoprotic acid. So that would just be one mark there for the two starting moles. And we can tell by inspecting these numbers that the hydroxide ion is indeed in excess, which means this pH at the end is going to be above 7. We need to calculate the moles of excess hydroxide by literally just working out the difference between those two numbers. And that gives us 3.5 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of hydroxide. And then we need to think about where we're going next. We are ultimately ending up calculating a pH, which means that our penultimate step needs to be to work out the hydrogen ion concentration. And since we're using a base now, we know that the base is in excess. And that means we are using the Kw expression. And so Kw is H plus multiplied by OH minus. And so there H plus is equal to Kw, which we've been given, divided by the hydroxide ion concentration which tells us that mark number three must be to work out what that hydroxide ion concentration now is. So we know the moles because we got that in mark number two. And so we have to work out concentration by doing moles divided by volume. The volume is the sum of the two volumes of solution that have been added because that hydroxide ion will be spread out in amongst this total volume, which is going to be 61.25 cm cubed. It won't stay in its initial volume that it was in. It was, it's going to spread out over all of that. And that gets us a hydroxide ion concentration of 5.71 times 10 to the minus 2. And then we plug that into our Kw expression by dividing 1 times 10 to the minus 14 by the answer that we've just got. And that gives us 1.75 times 10 to the minus 13, which is a really small number, which tells us we're going to have a quite a large pH as a result of that. And then we need to plug that into our pH expression. So negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration that we've just got gives us a final answer of 12.76 which I do recommend giving to two decimal points because that's a really good habit to be in for pH calculations. But actually, when the pH is greater than 10, they're usually quite forgiving and allow it to be to three significant figures, which is one decimal point when the value is above 10. So 12.8 would still get you that fifth mark here. But I recommend two decimal points for those good habits. OK, that's the end of this video. I hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.